Hello and welcome to the latest Threat Spotlight video from Cisco Talos. Today we have a special focus on four of the biggest trends uncovered by our Cisco Talos incident response team over the past three months. Now, firstly, there has been a huge rise in business email compromise attacks, and we have some examples to talk about here. And linked to that, why are more users clicking on that MFA push notification that they didn't initiate and then letting the bad guys in? That appears to be on the rise. We'll cover the large scale brute force activity against VPNs. And to round off the show, we'll talk about the ransomware landscape and why for one group, what we're seeing in the field actually contradicts some public reporting. So stay tuned. So the top threat that our team dealt with over the past three months was business email compromise attacks. Evidence of these types of attacks appeared in nearly half of all of our engagements, and that is more than double than the last quarter. So to tell us more about this, what's going on, is Craig Jackson from our Talos Incident Response Team. Adversaries are still very interested in money. Uh, it's it you know it, it drives it drives a lot of what adversaries are are their objectives and what they're looking to do not just with BEC but with ransomware as well uh, we as an example we saw a situation where a BEC attack a uh, business email compromise led to the adversary attempting to redirect an employee's direct deposit to an account that they own which is interesting because you know, in this case, this would also be a situation where the adversary is probably only going to get away with this once, because as soon as the first paycheck isn't received, the employee is going to go to the employer and say, I didn't get my paycheck. What happened? They're going to run down the investigation and realize, OK, this is what took place. And that's going to be the end of it. So it's a relatively small payout for the adversary compared to a larger BEC where we're redirecting you know, vendor payments of several hundred thousand dollars to an adversary controlled account. So we're seeing a spectrum of, of financial gain from the adversaries, but it seems like they're almost taking whatever they can get when they have the opportunity. What's quite interesting as well is that the top initial access vector uh, from the report is compromised credentials on valid accounts. Um, that happened in 29% of all of the engagements. And it is very likely that uh, BEC attacks played a big part in that in attackers um, trying to target the users, um, trying to gain their valid credentials so that they can log on, remain undetected and potentially uh, uh, conduct post compromise attacks. So yes, as Craig says, we're seeing a whole range in the type of activities from those one off financially motivated um, attacks to potentially attackers playing the longer game to get those valid um, account credentials to remain um, slightly more hidden than, than they might be otherwise. Um, so whilst we're in this quite high peak of BEC related activity, here is Craig's advice to organisations to help mitigate against them. I encourage organizations to have BEC playbooks because there's there's such a tremendous focus on other types of adversary TTPs. Uh, you know, the the methodology of ransomware recovery and response gets documented all the time. But in reality, BEC may not get that same level of attention when we talk about our recovery and response procedures. And that includes things like planning for out-of-band communications. We have seen situations where the adversary is still present in a compromised email box and is watching the organization discussing what to do via email. So if you have a business email compromise, please don't continue to use email to discuss what to do about it because the adversary is just going to continue to pivot around whatever you're trying to put in place. Let's now cover what was the biggest security weakness which triggered many of our incidents from the past quarter. And for the first time, that was actually users accepting unauthorized multi-factor authentications. And that happened in 25% of all of our incidents, closely followed by a lack of proper implementation of MFA. And that happened in 21% of all of our engagements. So to talk more about that and what we're seeing, here is Gagana from Talos Incident Response. Before focusing on the weaknesses that we have seen in the past quarter, I would just like to highlight and give a little tap on the shoulder of all of the defenders that have 
diligently implemented MFA in the environment in the past few years. Now we see cases of um, um, problematic implementations of user behavior related to MFA use, but MFA is there. So well done, everyone. Okay, so what can we do even better? Well, based on our incidents, what we saw in the field, we saw cases of social engineering where we have the attackers actually calling the help desk of the organization and asking for a SIM to be swapped or for MFA to be disabled because of loss of a fall. This is actually something um, which is quite easy to do. We, we have seen attackers using um, copies of the voice from the voicemail of the victim in order to sound more authentic. The other cases, um, it's something that I personally experienced this past quarter is having public facing systems without uh, MFA. And quite often those could be systems that are not on your radar as very important systems or actively used systems. So overall not having MFA on systems which can be accessed from the internet remains one of the weaknesses that we saw that was actively exploited. And all good things come into number three. So number three uh, weakness that we saw it is uh, MFA push notification exhaustion. So um, we all know the feeling of being bombarded with information and MFA is not different. Um, we see quite a lot of users actually giving in into this type of attack. So Gagana there talked about some of the trends that we're seeing attackers use to bypass MFA. Maybe one to highlight um, that we're seeing in the security community is an MFA bypass phishing kit. It's called Tycoon 2FA. And what it does, it's phishing as a platform. Pretty much it provides all the components that are needed in order to conduct an MFA bypass attack, including the attacker server with um, the fake uh, web page, which mimics very closely Microsoft 365 or Google uh, login page. The background components, the JavaScripts, which would pick up the, um, the session uh, cookie that is provided from legitimate logins and um, store it for the attacker to use to replay later on. But even also very um, well tailored, very customizable phishing email templates that could be used uh, by the attackers. And all of this in a platform uh, where you as an admin of the phishing attack can see how your attacks are progressing and tweak things here and there. So bearing all of that in mind, here is Gagana's advice to organizations when it comes to MFA and those attempts to bypass it. On the installation side, so if we're thinking from the process perspective, there are two things I can recommend. The first one is do not underestimate services as not being actively used or not interesting enough. This could be exactly the infection vector that allows an attacker to get into your environment. So uh, install MFA on all remote access services and identity management services, um, better safe than sorry. The second thing that defenders, so the admins can do, this is to think about the logs from MFA. We in instant response, we love logs. We talk a lot about the importance of logs and they are logs that uh, we, we tend to think right away, such as Windows event logs. But MFA logs can be a very valuable source of information. So if you have a central logging, please forward them there. If you have a SIM, make sure that those get uh, ingested and are readable. Next up is the rise in brute force activity targeting VPNs. To talk more about that is one of our security researchers, Bill. And essentially what we see is the attackers, uh, again, attacking that edge device uh, scenario, trying to gain access to that device so that then they can control the traffic for all of the devices below that level, right? And this is not unlike what you and I, Hazel, talked about with the year in review. We saw this as a growing trend as we, we were moving forward, right? It's those attacking those edge devices. And now we've seen uh, early in this year, um, several vendors having uh, public-facing exploitable um, vulnerabilities to these edge devices, whether they're VPNs or routers and those kind of things. And so um, the attackers are going to try to leverage those for a lot of reasons. But the biggest one is is if they can own that system, 
they can forward traffic from all those systems below there, right? And so there's a, a very huge return on investment for this. And some of them uh, don't require a massive skill set that you used to require in order to own an edge device, right? Like this isn't like breaking some of the encrypted and stuff that we've seen before on edge devices. Some of these are kind of simple. Uh, and so that's a trend that, and we're going to see this moving forward. We've seen nation states move towards this for a while now and it's increasing. And so we're going to see cybercrime do the same thing they always do, which is kind of follow what the nation state's doing, right? They're going to copycat and, you know, and so we're going to see that going forward. So as well as some of the details of this activity in the report, we also have a dedicated blog on this topic. Um, in that blog, you'll see the indicators of compromise and various recommendations on what to look out for. So here is Bill to highlight a few of those recommendations. Uh, if I was going to you know, take some early steps, uh, I'm going to start with the really boring stuff because <laughs> it really works. Make sure that you're patched. Uh, ensure that you never have any of the default credentials ever of, you know, like, please replace the default credentials with, you know, your own credentials. Ensure that your uh, dead credentials are wiped away as soon as possible. We've seen several times where um, credentials that were leveraged, you know, by initial access brokers, right, were credentials from someone who's been gone for six months or a year. Like, let's ensure the dead accounts are gone. And that includes dead networking accounts, right? Like, as we move from this gear to that gear, let's ensure that we've you know, looked at those things. And then uh, much to Gargana's point where she talked about the MFA logs, ensure that you're getting those edge logs and that they are uh, pulled into a SIM or something like that so that you can compare them and see them versus your other traffic. You're going to see reconnaissance events that are, you know, leading up to these things, mapping the network, right? And so they may not be from the same uh, IP addresses or ranges because the smart attacker is not going to come directly from where they were reconning from. But again, it's getting those things and pulling them together and ensuring that you're seeing that. I think that's really important. And finally, I just have a quick update on the ransomware landscape. Ransomware attacks are actually down this quarter from the last one, down by 11% actually, so quite significant. Um, one of the potential reasons for that, we've seen some quite high profile law enforcement operations recently. There was the one in December against Black Cat um, and of course Operation Kronos in February, which targeted Lockbit, Lockbit of course, the uh, number one ransomware as a service group for the past two years. Uh, so a very significant operation. Um, now, Lockbit did claim to resume their operations seven days after the takedown. So maybe we should refer to it more as a disruption than a takedown, but certainly a very, very valuable operation. And Lockbit are in a more vulnerable position now than they were before the takedown. We also saw new variants of the Akira and Phobos ransomware for the first time this quarter. Now that is especially significant in the case of Akira. They are they are a ransomware as a service group. They're known to target small to medium sized organizations. And public reporting had recently suggested that Akira had moved away from ransomware to more uh, data theft extortion. Well, our field experience tells us that they are now back to encryption and have been staging uh, multi-stage um, uh, attacks. So do check out the full report for the details on that. So we'll go ahead and put the link to the Talos Incident Response Quarterly Trends Report um, in the show notes. Do check it out. It's a really great in-depth resource. Um, talks a lot about the current threat actor trends and tactics and tools. And these are things that are affecting organizations on a daily basis. Um, of course, if you would like some support in building a response plan, getting ready for an incident, that is what Talos Incident Response is here for as well. So do have a read of everything that we can offer you.